and today we're going to talk about water quality. It is a broad topic on a lot of different places and it's going to probably take a good hour to get through. Let's see if I can go to the next one. Well, there we go. Uh, but just a brief outline what what we're going to be doing on David Crosby. I'm going to be talking uh, about water quality for aquaculture, aquaponics, uh, aquariums, and everything else. And I've been at Virginia State University for over 27 years working with uh, aquaculture, fish health, and everything else. And we're going to talk a little bit about water quality. We're going to cover oxygen, general parameters. We're going to talk a little bit about aquaponics, fish health, aquariums, and test kits. Okay. Just some of the general parameters that we need to be looking at in aquaculture or any kind of water quality situation where we're dealing with fish and water. We want to look at oxygen. We want to know something about the hardness of the water, which is calcium, magnesium, the alkalinity of the water. This is our buffering capacity. We're talking about carbonates, bicarbonates, and of course pH. You know, fish like a, a certain pH range that makes them happy. Then we're going to talk about total ammonia nitrogen or TAN and nitrites, chlorides, and temperature. And these are some of the various uh, fish test kits that you can get. They go from anywhere from $15 all the way up to $400 or more. Uh, the hawk kits are the uh, gold standard when it comes to water quality testing. I, I really like these kits. Uh, that's my personal preference. You have Lamont, they're good. Then you got these API stuff that's being used and you can get these off of uh, Amazon for about $20, $25. Okay, when we're talking about aquaculture ponds, we're only looking at a few parameters that we really worry about because we've got fish in the water, we've got a uh, aquatic ecology system going there that takes care of all the problems. And basically the water quality that we're looking at in these ponds is basically due to our feeding of these ponds in aquaculture. We're flowing a lot of organic materials in it by the feed. The feed is produced of waste and they can cause us some aquatic water quality problems. You know, we look at pH, the total ammonia nitrogen, which is really coming from the feed that we put into the ponds that have fish in. We got nitrites, and we want to look at the hardness and alkalinity because of, of uh, various species we're using. We want to make sure we have sufficient hardness and alkalinity of the water, and we don't have to look at that about once a month. But things like Ammonia, nitrites, we probably want to check at least once a week if we're raising a lot of fish in a pond. And we're talking a lot of fish in a pond. We're talking about 1,500, 5,000 fish to the acre. And there's some folks that's raised fish in ponds at those levels because they're trying to make a lot of production uh, with the uh, unit they're dealing with in a pond. Oxygen meters, uh, it's almost a must if you're doing pond aquaculture. Uh, we want to check just before sunset and about an hour afterwards. Uh, this And this oxygen testing depends on how much production. If we're pretty low intensive, uh, not so bad. Okay, your water quality parameters go in up causing all sorts of issues can result in fish scales and we definitely don't want to see our fish with the crossed eye and that's the reason we check for water quality well, that's the reason we check for oxygen ammonia nitrites in the system oxygen I, we're talking about having some means of testing for oxygen you got to do that if you're going to be real serious about aquaculture uh, we want to have some kind of aeration equipment blowers uh, backup oxygen tanks, depending on if we've got tanks and inside, we want to look at photosynthesis and the phytoplankton algae that produces the oxygen. Here we got a 
pond that has a lot of algae in there. Algae, believe it or not, produces the oxygen, goes into the water. But what really happens is at nighttime, at night, organisms need oxygen. The plants, the algae, are not producing oxygen, but they need oxygen for doing metabolic respiration. They are using up to 80 to 90% of the oxygen in the pond. Even the fish don't use that much. They use maybe 5 to 10% of the oxygen in the water, depending on the intensity of fish. If the oxygen gets too low, we see a result of a fish kill that results in some kind of aeration. Even with supplemental aeration, may not be enough to keep the fish from succumbing to low oxygen. And sometimes we have to add emergency aeration on top of this, like a tractor power paddle wheel. Again, you got to test the water. Oxygen meters can cost up to $1,000. Uh, they are based on two methods. They have an optical uh, probes, which work real well. Then you have the one that uses the electrical potential of oxygen in the water to create a current in the probe that measures oxygen. There's a chemical means, which only uh, limnologists really use if they're really getting serious. If the Winkler medicine is a chemical demand uh, system that measures oxygen, and this is very laborious. And, and takes a lot of effort. The Hawk FF1A fish kit that you can buy for about $400 has this method in it, so you don't have to spend $1,000, but it takes 20, 30 minutes to do this particular test. Again, oxygen levels. Again, uh, here's a YSI 55 uh, meter. This is probably the gold standard in the aquaculture industry. There's other meters out there available. These things can range from $600 to $1,000. Okay. Anything above five is considered safe for fish. We see five parts per million oxygen in the water. We're talking about milligrams per liter, parts per million of oxygen in the water. That's safe. If we start getting below that, we get into what we call the uh, cautionary, the stressful area. If we get too low, once we start getting below three, we can get into the lethal zone where fish are succumbing to low oxygen levels. Now, not all fish uh, are the same when it comes to low oxygen. You probably have heard stories about tilapia having no oxygen and a bunch of dead fish, but there's still some alive. Well, not all fish are like that. Some fish, when they start getting low oxygen, will start succumbing and have problems. That's when we need to do emergency air, air, aeration. Here's just an example of a, a simple propeller type aeration equipment that uh, has a motor with a prop. The prop moves and blows water up. These are not the most efficient systems. Uh, these things run about $1,000 and they go from half horsepower up to two horsepower uh, motors on these things. And you need to have electrical uh, connector uh, to your pond to order to operate these things. Um, and these things work fairly fairly well in small ponds, but if you're looking at large ponds, you might have to look at paddle wheels. These are what we use in a large, uh, large ponds of uh, 10 to 15 acres. Here is the small paddle wheel that's used uh, up here at the top. The yellow paddles on there are the ones that are used uh, in smaller uh, two to three acre ponds. Here's an example of a agitated electrical agitator that you can stick into a tank to agitate the water to keep oxygen in there. You can use blowers. In fact, there's some blowers designs for ponds and I don't think they work that well, but you might have to get a blower uh, to your system, your aquarium system, or you might have a bunch of tanks that you have, uh, that you're doing aquaponics with, and you need a serious blowing system to produce enough air to go into the system. You may want to have backup oxygen. You can buy uh, little oxygen generators that cost uh, several thousand dollars that produces oxygen, or you can get liquid oxygen to run into the system or you can have some kind of bottle backup system to your tanks. 
Again, if you're raising fish into in aquariums and tanks, it's a good idea to have some kind of backup because once your blower or electricity goes down in these systems, you have a very short time period to correct that issue. Otherwise, you're going to have a bunch of dead fish. You have approximately about 20 minutes, depending on how much fish you got in the tank per gallon, to correct that situation. So it's a good idea to have a backup generator if you use electricity or a liquid oxygen system or a tank system that has a solenoid switch on it that opens up uh, when the electricity opens uh, goes down, allows oxygen to be directly injected into your tank. Okay, oxygen, where do we get it from? We get it from plants and algae, that's our main source. Diffusion is the wet action of the movement of water and air over itself. Uh, again, photosynthesis depends on the sun. Uh, we have chlorophyll in a plant that takes carbon dioxide out of the water and through that process produces carbohydrates and oxygen. You know, plants do that regardless of the terrestrial or aquatic. Now, when the sun goes down, as I mentioned, the plants, the algae, the phytoplankton will use up, for example, phytoplankton will use up the oxygen levels in the pond up to 80% because they're no longer producing oxygen. So monitoring ponds at night is very, very important sometimes. Okay. General water quality parameters, part one. Here are some of the basic ones that we kind of consider about ponds all the time. We look at the pH, the alkalinity, and hardness. Uh, these and temperature of the pond. Temperature, you know, we're going to worry about whether or not we got trout in the water or uh, tilapia in the water. Tilapia is not a cold water species and they need to be above 55 degrees. Trout, when water gets warmer than 70 degrees, they die. So we worry about temperature. Okay, pH. Again, this is something that you want to monitor with a normal pH range, six and a half to nine. That's what we like to see in most systems. Again, pH is in, uh, in uh, aquaponics going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Again, lethal, four and 11. And this has half happened uh, in pond situations where people have added shake line to a pond thinking they're going to be able to get the uh, calcium up, but actually they're increasing the pH up into a dangerous level and actually kill a bunch of fish. Um, am I doing okay, Mark? Mark? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, fine. Okay, okay. Fine. I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm not talking and nobody's hearing me. Oh, no, you, yeah, it's going great. Okay, great. I'm just doing that check. And again, low pH is low, can be dangerous, and, but low pH can also interfere with fish reproduction. So once you start getting low pH, so how do we correct some of this stuff? How do we try to keep it in a good, safe range? Uh, you know, one thing we want to do is measure our pH on a regular basis. If we're in, let's go to the next slide. Alkalinity, this is where it's going to be key about trying to keep your, your uh, pH, moderate those pH changes. Uh, this is going to be our buffering capacity of the water. And we want to try to maintain uh, at least 50 parts from the alkalinity in the water. Uh, calcium carbonate, bicarbonates is what you want to use. Uh, sodium bicarbonate you can actually use in small ponds or in your system. If you got large ponds, you probably want to use agricultural lime to add to your pond. And we're talking about calcium carbonates uh, to be added to your pond. Now you can buy little strips for testing alkalinity. Here it says Hawk Kit Water Quality Test Strips Total Alkalinity. These are quite useful for farm pond owners who want to check to see if they got sufficient alkalinity. Again, uh, calcium carbonate is very useful. Uh, for, for ponds and others, and even uh, tanks too. But sodium bicarbonate is something we probably want to use on a, uh, a lot in aquariums and in 
aquaponics and tanks. Again, just to show you uh, the relationship between waters that uh, ponds that have good alkalinity versus water that has poor alkalinity. If you look at the pH graph, you see that at early morning, you know, that's when we see the lowest pH in a pond, then pH increases as photosensitivity activity uh, increases in a pond and uh, carbon dioxide is being removed from pond. So we see a pH increase. It reaches the peak in late afternoon. At night, carbon dioxide is injected back in the system and we result in a lower pH. We have a 24 hour cycle. And you can see a low alkalinity has big swings in pH while water of high alkalinity that has at least 50 parts per million has a smaller swing, a more flattened curve. Again, this just shows you the relationships of carbon dioxide, bicarbonates, and, and carbonates in the water based on pH. Uh, carbon dioxide disappears after 8.6 or 8.3 uh, in a pond. Hardness, again, uh, if you're using tanks, calcium chloride is very useful. Uh, gets calcium in the water very quickly. Uh, in ponds, we probably want to see this at least 20 parts per million or better. Uh, calcium is, is needed for growth of the fish. You need to have bones. Uh, and we're talking about the measurement of the divalent, calcium and magnesium. We worry about the calcium. Uh, you can get kits for measuring this. Again, calcium carbonate or lime, agricultural lime, is used to add to the ponds. And we can always do a soil test to make sure that we can add enough uh, calcium carbonate to a pond. Again, calcium chloride is very useful to have if you have tank systems and aquaponics. OK, temperature, you know, we do have, uh, it's important because uh, if there is an optimum levels that fish will grow at, uh, some do better at 85, some do better at uh, 65. So, you know, we have a lethal ends and we have areas that's uh, uh, range that are, are adequate for growth. Uh, also, temperature can be a stress too. You know, for hybrid striped bass, if they get too hot uh, in a pond, uh, to get to up in the 90s in the pond, they could be stressed out. Uh, or tilapia uh, starts getting stressed out if the temperature gets below 55 degrees, 60 degrees in the water. Trout, you know, when the water hits 70 degrees, we can see some problem. Also, temperature can influence disease outbreaks in the pond. There are certain diseases that have a certain temperature range that will cause a disease outbreak. And you can use all sorts of different instruments. Uh, you get old infrared uh, temperature reading. You can use that to get the surface temperature of the water. It doesn't me measure what's in the water. It's just hitting the surface of the water. A good thermometer will get below the surface area where, where the water is real hot and get you a more accurate reading of your water. OK, part two, nitrogen cycle total ammonia nitrogen, nitrites that we have in there. Again, uh, a lot of times our ammonia, we were talking about earlier, we got fish and food, that's gonna produce our ammonia levels, the NH3 and your ionized ammonia. We have bacteria in the water that converts the ammonia into nitrites, nitrobacteria convert to nitrate, and nitrates are what we need for our plants, then the plants will express that as nitrogen gas back into the atmosphere. So we have a, a cycle, even though I show a very simplistic uh, schematic uh, cycle here is more a little bit more complex. Again, uh, when we're raising fish, no matter what we're raising fish in ponds, tanks and all that, your total ammonia, nitrogen can be a very serious problem. And this is going to come from feed. It does not take a whole lot of toxic uh, ammonia. Uh, the unionized portion of the 
ammonia, the NH3, which is toxic to the fish. Uh, and as you can look, only studies that show 0 0.06 parts per million of, of this uh, unionized ammonia can cause gill damage. So we you want to check this in ponds on a, on a weekly basis. And if we're in raising tank, we want to do this every day. The relationship is that the higher the pH in the system, the more uh, unionized ammonia we have. And it's also the higher the temperature we'll have that too. So we try to keep the pH back in the seven and eight so we don't have a whole lot of toxic ammonia. So if you can see, if you get up to nine, you're really increasing your toxic ammonia. You can buy all sorts of test kits just for this particular uh, aspect. We know that if we, uh, in a pond situation where we have a lot of fish and we're feeding, uh, 100 pounds worth of feed will get approximately uh, two pounds of total ammonia nitrogen to the system. And a lot of recommendations is to say, we keep this around 80 pounds per acre of feed per acre. Okay, nitrites. This is one of the things that happens sometimes in our cycle. We have a buildup. The ammonia is converted to nitrites. The nitrites get hung up, not being converted to the nitrates very fast. And we get a buildup of nitrites, the NO2s in the system. Uh, brown blood disease is what we are talking about. And we have various test kits that uh, are chlorometric. And you can see as the color gets more intense and red color, the higher the total um, parts per million or milligrams per liter of nitrates we have in the system. You can see in the lower picture of catfish, you got two pictures of catfish where the caudal fin were uh, decapitated. And you can see on the white paper, uh, one has brown color and the other has red. The top catfish has uh, nitrite toxicity that's causing the brown blood disease. And the problem with brown blood disease is that it, 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 it enables, it causes the hemoglobin of the blood to shut down. The hemoglobin, it takes up the nitrite and it cannot take up oxygen. It blocks the oxygen getting on the hemoglobin of the blood, which results in the color change of the blood itself. Uh, salt, it's usually what we use to guard against us because the, uh, let's, well, let me go back. Uh, what happens a lot of times is that the nitrites, the NO2 are crossing the gills of the fish. The salt, the chlorides act as a blocker for these passages of the nitrites into the blood, which prevents the nitrites from getting into the fish, which allows the fish blood to return back to normal red but this is a stress of a fish and we can see some diseases later on. Aquaponics, nitrates, we worry about nitrates because we need to feed the plants. Calcium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, B8. These are some of the critical things we worry about as well as ammonia and nitrites in a system. Okay, just a simple system. What happens, we have a biofiltering system, we have ammonia, that ends up feeding the plants, that uh, the nitrites in the plants. That's good, not harmful to the fish. And that's what happens. Okay. Calcium carbonate. Uh, we need this for good plant growth. Uh, we can add that to our, we can add uh, alkalinity that needs to be high in these systems. We need at least 100 parts per million of carbonates in the system. We also need it for a good biofilter. You can buy these strips. Uh, again, we need to see the water uh, fairly hard uh, in these systems for aquaponics in order for them to be effective. Again, and we're talking about carbonate in the system. Uh, sodium bicarbonate is your ideal uh, chemical to add to the water. You want to keep this around 100 or better than 100. This will give our uh, keep our pH from getting too high. One of the first things you go see in a aquaponic system, if you're not watching the 
amount of uh, carbonates you go see a pH crash. In other words, if they'll get below six and a half in a system and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. We want to check uh, every day. And if this is something that on a system need to be checked every day, you had to buy strips. These are about $15, $20 for 50. Uh, basically, uh, we can just add a, just a quarter pound of this stuff for every pound of feed we're to the system. If you're adding just a half a pound of feed per day to the system, we're talking about one eighth pound of uh, sodium bicarbonate. A sodium bicarbonate is something that you would probably be adding on a daily basis um, to your uh, aquaponic system. So you do need to have some kind of test kit that measures alkalinity, pH, ammonia in the system. Okay, and just this shows you how uh, the relationship of pH, how different uh, micronutrients are released into the system that's necessary for your plants. So basically, we're probably trying to keep a pH between six, seven, and uh, no higher than eight. So if we start getting blow, we start seeing uh, some items not getting released into the system. Okay, just to show you what happens, uh, why we see some problems in aquaponics is because our biofilter sometimes doesn't mature quick enough. One of the first things we see in a system is ammonia levels uh, spike in the system. And again, ammonia systems can be problematic uh, for fish health. And then the system kicks in, we start seeing our nit nitrites kick in. Then by almost three weeks later, we start seeing our nitrate. So it could take up to three weeks for your uh, filters to mature well enough to convert all the water quality uh, components into nitrates that eventually ends up as nitrogen. Again, there is kits specifically designed just for aquaponics. Lamont makes one. Uh, it, it's a, it does the nitrates and phosphorus and a few other things that you don't get with the uh, hot uh, FF1A fish farmers kit. So you may want to look at one of these kind of kits. Okay, fish health, aquatic, aquatic uh, environment, toxic algae, gas bubble disease, ammonia toxicity, brown blood. I'm going to talk a little bit about infectious diseases here. Okay, okay. The key to any fish health is is the environment. That's the reason we want to check these water quality parameters. Um, um, uh, that's what's critical. One of the most critical things that we can do uh, in, in uh, raising fish is fish health. The other most critical thing, which is kind of off subject, is feed. Uh, feeding is probably the most important management job in any aquaculture situation. Next is going to be your water quality. Again, we do have harmful algae. We have cyanobacteria. Uh, known as blue-green algae. Uh, here's an example of microcystis. They can produce uh, algal toxins that can also kill fish, and, but they also can kill cattle and everything else. And sometimes we have an a interesting protozoan called Iguina that has red pigment, and they pop up, and sometimes you see this in ponds with water turning red, and this can be a ichthyo toxin that can kill fish too. So we can see these things pop up. Uh, copper sulfate or low levels of copper control or, or uh, Q-train plus will keep these uh, organisms uh, at low levels in ponds. Uh, another example is uh, gas bubble disease. You may see this in hatcheries or in tanks where you get too much gases being into your water. We get a super saturation of gas. And if you look at this picture here, this is pretty classic. You see air bubbles on the eyes. And this is because we got too much uh, uh, gases in the water. And this is actually causes trauma in the fish and causes damage in the fish itself. Uh, to organs, gills, 
and other parts of the fish. And fish can actually die from this. This is something uh, I've seen this in with catfish hatcheries uh, that were done, uh, were pulling water from deep wells because the wells were at the, the correct temperature for growing catfish, but they were injecting too much air into the system being pulled up, which end up saturating the, the uh, water with nitrogen. And a lot of times this is nitrogen uh, gases that cause this kind of problem. Okay. We've been talking about ammonia, how important it is and how toxic and damaged it can be. Now ammonia uh, can cause slow growth, uh, stress the fish, damage organs, damage the gills. Uh, so this is something we want to look at, make sure that we're not getting a buildup of this, uh, the, un the ionized, the non-ionized portion of uh, the toxic. We got two portions, ionized, unionized. And again, pH is real important with how much of the uh, ionized versus unionized. Here's a histopathology uh, microscope uh, photograph of gills showing damage to the gills due to uh, ammonia toxicity. You can see the little filaments that's coming off of the gill there, gill filaments. And this is what allows water to pass uh, over the gills and collect oxygen. But as you can see, there's damage to some of the gill filaments um, due to uh, uh, poor uh, hyperplastic growth of the cells that fuses these filaments together that reduces the ability of the gill to take in oxygen. Again, uh, gills, these are filaments. Uh, this is where a lot of exchanges of ammonia, nitrites, and waste products take place in the gills. Uh, nitrites can be uh, dangerous to some species of fish. Some fish are very sensitive to uh, nitrite toxicity, the NO2s in the water. Catfish and trout are real sensitive. Some species are not. Uh, regardless of the species sensitivity, it's still a toxicity problem that can be stressful to the fish. And this is something we want to uh, take care of. Salt, sodium chloride will correct this problem, whether it's in ponds, aquariums or aquaponic systems. This allows the fish to clear the nitrite uh, out of the system that has attached the hemoglobin of the fish red blood cell, the, which will now allow oxygen to attach its uh, nitrites. Uh, this situation here, uh, not only can we kill fish due to the nitrite toxicity or brown blood uh, diseases, it also can cause problems with down the road after being stressed out due to the brown blood disease. We can see infectious diseases. We can see bacterial diseases come in on the fish. We can see protozoan diseases. And this may, may be three weeks down the road. It may not happen the next day, but the stress results in a disease situation in the fish as, as far out as three weeks after the episode of having nitrites toxicity. Infectious diseases, and we have various groups that we can cause problems, fungus, virus, bacteria, parasites, all of, falls under the infectious disease group. Just basically looking at a model here, you know, we have uh, a pathogen, we always see pathogens out there, we have the environment. Remember, this is critical. That's the reason we're doing water quality analysis of our ponds or aquariums and aquaponic situation. If this goes bad, you know, we have a host. And pathogens are always out there. We're bacteria, parasitic, virus. They're always hanging around, working out there, but they're not causing diseases. What happens is the poor environment forces the pathogen host to come together that results in a disease situation, which results in a, a epizootic of a either a bacterial 
situation like we're showing here, which is a uh, enteric septic seeing uh, catfish as a result due to poor environment. Uh, fungus, here's an example of fungus taken off the gills. Uh, bacteria, this is uh, known as uh, columnaris. Uh, you can find this on fish that are that have been stressed out and this is usually a secondary problem. This can be on the skin of the fish or actually uh, systemic in the fish. Uh, this is an example of uh, parasitic. Something that we never hardly see is tapeworms because we never look in the intestine of the fish, but fish do get uh, uh, tapeworms. Okay, aquariums. Let's go into aquariums a little bit. Salinity, temperature, and egg. Okay, here's just an example of just a, a carp here. And you can see uh, fish can get everything. If you got aquarium fish, there's all sorts of stuff you can have. Uh, you know, you can get uh, costia, white spot, which is it. You can have a little crustacean, argus, uh, fungus, you get fin rot, I mean, ulcers, uh, leeches, even. Uh, drops due to bacterial problems, gill flukes. I mean, there's all sorts of different things on a fish, especially in aquariums that can cause us problems. Okay, salinity. You may want to have your salinity in your aquarium because you're raising salt water fish or uh, things to just show you. There's simple uh, meters to measure that to make sure you get the correct uh, level that you need it. You have a hydrometer, which is just looking at the uh, water density to give you the correct uh, uh, parts per million of uh, salt salinity in the water, and it's based on specific gravity. Higher specific gravity of the water, uh, the, you know, the uh, more shows you that it's got more salt. You can get your salinity rectophonometer that allows you to measure that. You can see you got a little ocular eyepiece you look at, you put some, some some uh, drop of water, you look at the eyepiece and eyepiece, you see some uh, marking and you can read what level of salinity you have. This will be in parts per million. You can see you have to look for a little line. So that's something you may want to have. These things, the little hydrometer, I think I won't on Amazon, I've seen it for about $8. These uh, refractometers can run anywhere from 20 to uh, to several hundred dollars, depending on the quality. Disease temperature relationships. If you're raising uh, any kind of aquarium fish or any fish in that, uh, there is certain temperatures that diseases like. And some fish likes to be in a certain temperature, higher temperature than lower temperature. So you need to watch that temperature in any system here. Uh, White spot ick is probably one of our more famous ones about water temperature. And this is something that you would probably worry about more than anything else in an aquarium system, even though you can bring in all sorts of bacterial diseases and other parasitic. But this one is, seems to be the most common one that we worry about. Uh, if you bring uh, new fish into your aquarium, it may be a good thing to isolate and quarantine that fish for several weeks to make sure uh, you don't have ick, or you make sure that your fish that you have in your aquariums that you can at least have 85 degree water or better. Uh, ick usually does very well between uh, 68 to 77, and usually if you get above 80, 85 degrees, uh, ick does not multiply. And if you do get it in there and you got to keep fish in at a lower temperature, it requires a lot of um, treatments to control that. Just shows you an example of ick, what it does to gills. Uh, you can see all these little organisms in there. They're, they get into the gill, they cause all sorts of gill damage. It gets on the skin. The problem is with ick, um, it has a life cycle. And one thing we've learned about ick is that they can actually go through mitosis and actually don't have to go for the, the, the uh, general life cycle where it drops off and produces these little uh, uh, infective organs that come, organisms that come back and infect the gill. They can just go ahead and reproduce right there on the gill. 
And here's a classic photograph of Ick. You can see a nice little C-shaped uh, nucleus. And they're probably they're big enough to see with the naked eye. They look like little pin drops, uh, little white specks on a, on a, on a uh, fish. Uh, again, they're up to one millimeter in size, easily seen. And if you put it on the microscope, again, that little C-shaped nucleus tells you without a doubt what you have. And here's another example of ick, how it's destroying the epithelia of a cell. Okay, water test kit. Oh, we're getting, we're getting towards the end. I'm going faster than I thought. Uh, there's several water test kits out there. Uh, Hawk is probably your gold standard. Lamont is very good. A lot of folks like that. You can get all sorts of different kits. Uh, again, kits like Hawk kits, like the FF1A, uh, which we showed the examples of earlier, can uh, cost up to $350 to $400. Lamont runs in the same thing. API test strips, another. Uh, API, you can get different uh, kits. And they will say aquarium, freshwater test kits for aquarium. One thing you want to look for when you're looking for these kits, make, make sure that, uh, make sure that, uh, that uh, you can test for pH, uh, ammonia, Make sure that you get right. Make sure that you can test uh, for uh, nitrites, nitrites, and ammonia on these uh, tests. These tests usually run about twenty to thirty dollars. You can buy strips. Uh, you can get them to do all sorts. You can get all sorts of things for small spools and all that. You can get things that give you more tests than you want, like iron and copper, lead. But again, nitrate, hardness, alkalinity, pH. Uh, we can uh, uh, do a little bit something different later on. Um, again, strips, these things, they strip run about uh, uh, $20 for 50 to 100. Okay. Uh, we do. We do have a, a diagnostic lab that we can do water quality and help you out with any of these problems. Right now, only way, uh, uh, only way uh, we we're kind of not doing things at the lab because of the COVID, and we can call me anytime. Any questions? Stop sharing. Okay. Any questions? Hello. I haven't seen any in the chat, Doc. So. No, I haven't either. Yeah, that was not quite an hour, but there's a lot of information there in a short space of time. Mm -hmm. So, again, the, there's an importance on these. Again, this is just a quick overview of a lot of things. So, you can understand. I, your um, uh, between 67 and 77 for white spot. It will grow at much colder temperatures, but it takes a lot longer. You can see it during the winter time in ponds, but you never know there because the life cycle runs uh, on weeks instead of uh, within 24 hours. Uh, if you want to see it grow very fast, you know, between 67, 77 degrees is one of the optimum growth range for it. Somebody asked, it, yeah, okay, Mark said, it'll be on the YouTube channel. Uh, it may take a couple of days to get, um, 
them uh, closed captioned and that kind of stuff. So give it about 48 hours and they should be up. Isn't that right, Mark, about 48 hours? Well, that's kind of aspirational, but... Uh... Or more. It could be 72 or more. It's, it's going to be a while, I think, because the holidays. There's a lot of uh, admin that are taking their uh, time off right now. And a lot yeah. of folks are taking, taking uh, vacation times right now. The problem is we have to, when we publish something, we have to make sure it's accessible for the hearing impaired. And so we have to do the subtitles. Um, so that means somebody has to just go through and correct all the subtitles. That can take some time. Yeah, between the closed captioning and everything, it does take some time. It does, and we're, and we're actually turning some of this stuff over to our admins for doing. That's something that they've been assigned for doing is to run the captions on this. So this was supposed to have been about one hour and went about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, if anybody's interested in receiving a PDF file of this presentation, I'd be more than happy to send it to you uh, with the information on it. So, uh, so we can do that. Uh, you know, you know. Sometimes I try to judge how many slides and how far I go. Uh, I could have had a lot more slides now. I want to realize on this talk. So, I appreciate everybody coming. I hope you got what you're looking for. Uh, for the PDF file, just uh, dcrosby at vsu.edu, just email me. Uh, uh, on all this stuff. I'll put your email in the chat box for those okay. that want the PDF, just let him know. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to sit and get to the chat box myself. Okay, anything, anybody else got any questions or anything? Um, we can, um, I can get the, if you want to type your email in the chat, if you'd like, uh, an email when the video is, is available. You can just type your email right there in the chat. And I'm gonna I'm gonna type my email myself so folks can email me. Yeah go ahead. Just email me and I want to get this thing out to you. That's one thing we have done with these things on request is that we convert this easily into a PDF files so we can have it. Uh, come back at what, 1130? And you can go to uh, Farm Pond Management. That's be another program we got coming. I uh, hope everybody registered for that. How many folks did we have today, 36? Uh, I, saw I think I saw 37. 30 some wow that's an all-time high great and if anyone wants there's another program today on basic pond maintenance uh i'll put the link in there that's at 11 30. yeah 11 30. yeah and i think this is gonna be our last uh powerpoint presentations for the year so. And we're working on a series um, like ponds, I guess, or basically it's like ponds 101 for next spring. So there'll be several sessions throughout. There's going to be, I think we're going to have at least 10, 11, 12 yeah. sessions yeah. on that. It's going to be fairly extensive. And I get, what I need to try to do is figure out how we can get that as going to continue education courses. I don't know how, how much effort I have to do to do that. But that might be something to look at. So, 
just in case everybody can be on the lookout for that as well. Well, Cynthia, I appreciate your help again. And Mark, I'm glad we got you to help us out. Uh, sure. And I think, say, well, next year, I think it's going to be the admins who are running the programs. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll have some meetings about that. Yeah, because we need to, because, you know, I was trying to get on. It took, took me about 15 clicks before I was able to get on. Now, I would, I'm going to exaggerate, but the, it mm -hmm. took, took a few clicks of the link before I got something shown. I don't know if it was just my computer or, or something else. Well, your connection seems better today. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely better. <laughs> I'm, I'm not using my Chromebook today. Oh. <laughs> what I did, I, I, I went and spent uh, 10 or $15 and bought a webcam for the, uh, the uh, desktop. Mm -hmm. And and I said I'm gonna stick my my uh, head microphone into what it says just headphone, and I wasn't mm -hmm. sure I was gonna get microphone capabilities or not, but I guess I did get microphone capabilities. Yeah. So right. that's that's good. So right. um, so I kind of changed up the setup up the house. I was gonna try to do this for my office, but I'm, I'm at the house now. Well, I appreciate again everybody coming. I hope that you uh, uh, enjoyed what you got today. Let us know if, what else you would like to see. Again, this was just a real basic overview of everything. I mean, we covered everything on in water quality today. And believe me, we could just have uh, easily a one-hour program on every topic that we talked about today.